this is a picture that uh, is very old. This is a classic uh, painting. Uh, Adam is naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And uh, although this is kind of a pre-scientific worldview, I think in many ways it still shapes a lot of discussion both in, in science and philosophy because it really emphasizes this idea of discrete natural kinds. So, so here is, uh, here is the, 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 the human and people often talk about, let's say in the context of artificial intelligence or whatever, they, they talk about the human mind. And so what they mean is, is, is a modern mature human like this. And then there are, some, there are some other things and everybody knows what the difference is between these, these different things. Okay, but, um, but we now know both on the uh, evolutionary timescale and the developmental timescale that actually there are no discrete natural kinds here in the sense that all of this is a very smooth gradual continuum. So, so, so we, we, we stand uh, uh, as at one particular point of a very long set of uh, very smooth gradual changes that uh, eventually make, uh, make significant alterations to our capabilities but it's it's really you have to you have to understand the whole continuum to to understand what what this thing is capable of and this sort of this this magical agential glow where people say well humans are do this and then machines or animals do something else it it becomes very clear that you can't just draw a nice boundary about a, a crisp boundary around a modern human you have to understand where do these things come from um, and in fact it's it's even it's even worse than that because not only are we part of the this natural continuum but there's actually now we see that we are part of a an engineering continuum, both in terms of biological changes and in terms of uh, technological hybridization, where at every level of the organism, we can mix in uh, different components. Some of them are evolved, some of them are engineered. Uh, and and uh, so, so again, there's this gradual slow uh, set of changes to where, where uh, one uh, might ask, where do these various um, properties begin and end and how do they change? So my framework, uh, really is is focused on the on, on this goal of being able to simultaneously to, together consider very unconventional agents. So I want to think about all possible beings. So this is familiar creatures like us, birds, uh, apes, you know, octopus, things like that. But also very strange creatures like colonial organisms and swarms and engineered synthetic biology that might be made, artificial intelligence, whether in software or hardware, uh, and possible exobiological agents. We should be able to think about all of these things using the same tools. And that uh, forces us to ask, what do they all have in common? If it isn't origin story, and it isn't uh, the material from which they are made, then the question is, what, what do they all have in common? And uh, of course, I'm not the first person to try for something like this. Here's a Wiener and colleagues um, scale that goes all the way from, from passive matter all the way up to uh, kind of human level, second order metacognition and so on. And so, and so my framework uh, needs to be able to uh, say something about this. What do they all have in common? and to move experimental work forward. This is critical where we, I'm not interested in uh, just um, a conceptual uh, philosophy. I'm interested in things that interface with the real world and, and drive new discoveries. And so uh, kind of a central uh, component of this is the idea that the kinds of systems that we're interested in exist on a, a spectrum and it's a spectrum of persuadability. What that means is that there is an observer uh, and it might be the system itself, it, it, but it doesn't have to be an external observer. It's, it's, it's systems are also observers of themselves and their own parts. But there's an external observer that must ask the question, what is the most efficient way to interface, functionally interface with that system? So for example, for certain systems like, like uh, mechanical clocks, um, you're not going to convince them of anything. You're not going to reward or punish them. The only thing you can do is modify them via hardware and, uh, or hack them in that, in that simple sense. Uh, there are other systems that are uh, so these kind of cybernetic homeostatic systems where you might be able to take advantage of the fact that uh, they pursue simple kinds of goals and you might rewrite uh, or edit some of those goals and let the system take care of the rest. And then more complex agents, you can uh, harness rewards and punishments and let the system make all of the necessary internal changes in itself to uh, behave differently in the future according with the experiences that it's had. So you rely on its learning interface. And then of course, uh, at some level you get to systems that are able to uh, pursue uh, reasons, not just causes, and there you, you can uh, interact with this system in a very different way. And of course, everything in between, these are just four, four way, waypoints, there are many more waypoints. But the idea, the, 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 the point here is that 
we cannot uh, assume where things stand. You cannot sit back in, in a sort of philosophical armchair and say, well, this is just a machine or it's just a piece of physics or whatever, and therefore I know it has to be down here. You actually don't know that. Um, you have to do experiments and you have to try these various uh, stances and see what affords. It's, a, it's an empirical question, which affords the most, uh, the richest and the, and the best interaction, you know, hardware modification or uh, maybe even something like this. So uh, the, the key to um, is starting to think like this is, is to realize that all of us uh, journeyed across this, uh, what, what used to be called the Cartesian cut, this idea that uh, we all start life as a single cell. It's a quiescent oocyte and people look at it and say, well, this is a little blob of chemistry and physics. It is not cognitive. It, is, it does not have uh, what, what are, you, know, you, you name it, uh, whatever you're interested in. Uh, just, it's just, uh, just chemistry and physics. But slowly and gradually, we become one of these things or maybe even something like this, a, 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 a deeply thinking um, a human that's going to make claims about being more than a machine and so on. And so the thing about uh, developmental biology, I think it's, it's the most magical of all sciences because there you literally see in front of your eyes at a, desk, at a bench top, if you look at, for example, a frog embryo, you literally see the journey from, from physics and chemistry to a scale up of mind. And, um, and, and, and these steps, and, and, and the key is that developmental biology offers no special a moment at which some sort of lightning flash gives you a true cognition, whereas before you just had chemistry and physics, that, that there's, no, there's no such point. So it's just a slow, slow uh, uh, transformational process. But we can think at least we're a unified intelligence, right? We all feel ourselves as, as one unified being, and, and we don't think we're the same as, let's say, a colony of ants, which is a, like a traditional um, collective intelligence. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, we, we, we're, we're, a, we're, we're not a collective intelligence, right? We're, we're, we're unified in some sense. Um, in fact, in fact, Descartes was really into the uh, pineal gland because there was only one of them in the brain, and he felt that the the unified character of human experience uh, required uh, a, a singular. Uh, structure in the brain to to mediate it, but if he had had access to good microscopy, what he would have seen is that actually there's not one of anything uh, in inside that pineal gland is this. This is what it looks like. There are many many cells, and inside each of those cells, there's all of this stuff. So uh, just just a tremendous, and this isn't even this is by no means all. So we are uh, we are uh, very much a uh, a collective. Um, in fact. Um, I think all intelligences are collective intelligences in the sense that they're made of parts, and we really need to understand how this uh, how this scale up um, happens. Uh, this is this is the kind of thing we're made of. This is a single cell. So this is a free, this happens to be a free living organism known as a lacrimaria. You can see what it's doing. It's 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 uh, hunting and it's uh, for food in its environment. It has huge competencies for single cell level agendas. So it uh, handles its physiology, its um, anatomical needs, its uh, metabolic needs, and so on, all at the scale of one cell. There is no brain. There's no nervous system. Uh, this is the agential material out of which we are all made. And individual cells have lots of competencies. And we need to start thinking about this because we're used to, we're used to thinking about uh, coarse grained higher level beings. For example, here's a rat. The rat presses a lever, learns to get the reward, and now the rat uh, owns the associative memory between pressing the lever and getting the reward. But in fact, there are no individual cells in this creature that had both experiences. There were cells at the bottom of the, of the uh, foot that interacted with the lever. There are cells in the gut that uh, reap the, uh, the, the, the sugar of the reward, but no individual cell has both experiences. So who is it that actually owns the association? Who, what, what can make the association between these two experiences? And what is this, this rat that we say? Uh, it, it, it requires, this whole, this whole process requires a kind of cognitive glue. It requires a way to uh, synthesize from the experiences of individual cells to something much larger that can have goals and preferences and um, competencies, memories, agendas, and so on that no individual cell has. And so we need to understand that. Uh, and, and this is now, now this seems very common. This, this happens all the time. So we're kind of used to this, but there are some, some very interesting cases that tell us that uh, the story is actually quite, quite more, uh, much more complex.